All right. Man, I'm so glad to be in church today. For real. I hope I hope you're glad to be here. Uh, I want to give a huge shout out to my all my friends in uh, the Video Cafe. They're the best people in the whole church, uh, along with this group right here. I mean, you know, together we're the best group. And uh, thanks for being over there and, and uh, saying amen and being involved on that side. And it's awesome. I got, I've got one other little quick announcement, and that's it's a good thing. Last weekend, we hit record attendance for our church that we've ever had on just a regular Sunday. It was crazy. And some of you have heard that we're adding a service in, in March, which we are. And so that's good. Starting in March, there'll be three morning options and one night option. Um, but what we need is I need to add some more volunteers to make that happen. And listen, people are, we had 20 people pray with us to come to know Jesus in their life last weekend alone. And I just go, come on, doesn't that make you just want to show up and help out, you know? And maybe you used to be on a team. What we ask is if you're on a team, maybe you're on the kids team or the door greeters or whatever. And it's, it's once a month. And uh, if you go, man, I could do that. I want to do that. Stop at the information counter after church and just say, hey, I'm willing to help out and maybe get back in the game. And we would love to have you. That would be so helpful to us. All right. I'm uh, in a series and I had a great time last week with Pastor Lisa. We got to share about um, just some life tips from that we've learned. And isn't my wife is one of the best speakers. She just does such a great job. So inspiring. She preached the week before that. She preached on Thursday night to the young people. It was fire. She's on a world tour. You can just get an autograph afterwards. Me, I'm just going to do my, I'm going to give it my best shot today. So we're going to see what we can do. Hey, uh, I'm going to dive in uh, to, I want to know what love is part three. And I want to just read a really great scripture from the very end of the gospels, meaning the end of the story about Jesus's life. He died on the cross. He's been resurrected. He's given kind of like final instructions uh, to his disciples. In my mind, when I'm reading this part of the Bible, I hear the song, uh, Final Countdown, you know, in the background. It's just me, child of the 80s. And so here's the verse, and uh, Jesus is, is talking, and he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And then it's in quotes, and Jesus gives us the message that was predicted that everybody would take to the whole world. And this is the message, there is forgiveness of sins to all who repent. And, and that's some of the best news ever, best words ever. Listen, there's forgiveness of my sins if I repent. That's good news. There's forgiveness of your sins if you repent. Like, it's just... It's across the board. It's everybody. There's forgiveness of sins for you if you repent. That's great news. Some of you will catch it by the time we're done today, and it'll be life-changing. It's going to be amazing. So that's my simple message today is this. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. In light of that, I want to talk to you about a kind of love that uh, many of us experience in our life. I want to talk about um, the, the word in Greek is eros. It's physical love. It's a physical intimacy. It's the kind of love that God designed for a man and a woman when they're married. And I'm going to be honest today with you, if that's all right. Y'all cool with that? I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to be helpful, hopefully. And I'm going to be discreet because we've got a lot of different ages in here. So if I say, like, physical intimacy, all the, all the peeps in the know are like, mm-hmm, I, I know what he's saying. And then other people who don't are just, like, still, like, playing Pokemon on their phone. So we're good for everybody. <laughs> Let's start in Genesis today. Back at the beginning of the Bible, God's plan, woman hasn't even been created yet. She was the crowning jewel. And here's, it's just God and, and, and Adam, and here's what happens. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And this is biblical permission for men to take naps on Sunday. Come on, somebody, right there. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. And he brought her to the man. And then men don't know what to say ever. So Adam blows an opportunity and says these dumb words. At last, this is one, uh, is bone of my bone. It's so romantic. And this is flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken from the man. And then the author was a man too, I believe. So he says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother, and his, I'm like, that explains it, really? Anyway, he, that explains why a man 
leaves his father and mother to join to his wife. Come on, the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both <clears throat> naked, and they felt no shame. All praise to the creator, the inventor of good things. Come on, somebody. Created that for procreation and for pleasure, both of those within the context of a marriage between a man and a wife. God is good. Amen to God's word. Every generation has a battle to fight. Um, every generation that grows up, if I'm talking about people who are Christians, Christ followers, they have a generational battle to fight. So in some generations, they were fighting against persecution, literally being put to death if they said, I'm a Jesus follower. And that was the battle they had to fight. Some generations fought for social justice. And that was the battle, it was the front line battle of that generation. Some were defending the Bible in their generation from being eradicated and literally all the Bibles being gathered and burned to try to eliminate the word of God. Others were fighting again, uh, you know, on the fight for abolition and others fought against heresy. Whatever generation you're in, there's a battle. I, I want to tell you what I believe the battle is in our day. I think the battle in our day is, is unique and specific to our generation, and it's this, radicalized hyper-individualism, where we go, it's all about me. Everything is about me, my preferences, and what I want, how I want it. This is, shows up in a lot of different ways. It shows up in that there are 47 different flavors of M&Ms you can buy, and if you don't like those, you can go online and customize what they print on your M&Ms. Like, it's crazy. I had my iPhone out at one point, I must have, and I had said something like, uh, I like shoes, you know, I want these shoes or whatever, uh, it was right before my birthday, after that, all my Instagram ads are shoe ads, and I'm like, this is crazy and creepy, has anybody experienced that, I thought about doing this, I really, in fact, I'm going to try it right now, I really want to buy a really cool toilet seat, and I just want to see what happens, you know what I mean, and see if I get some ads for that, but Everything is tailored, all the algorithms, every, all the streaming content you can get, it, it's tailored for exactly your personal desire and preferences. And it's radicalized hyper-individualization. And this shows up primarily in two ways in our culture. Number one, it shows up in the idea of self-governance and independence. And the second way is free expression in pursuit of intimate desires. And so we say phrases in our culture like this. Don't tell me what to do, and don't tell anybody else what to do. And so that's kind of the ground we live in, and yet everybody's wanting to be super moral, super outraged, super woke, super concerned about all these things, and it's like there's constant that, but then you can't say anything about certain things because you're hyper-radicalized. What, so let me just switch gears for a second. What, what do people need? Like, some of you maybe have traveled. I've, got, I've had the privilege of traveling to different places, South America a few times, and um, been to Africa once, and a few different places around, around the world. When you go to certain places, you're aware that, man, like this morning, I woke up in a bed with a, with a, you know, a house around me, and I, I got to choose what shoes I want to put on. I could pick what I wanted to eat for breakfast. My car worked and got me here on time, and, and we have a pretty good and, and really what happens is when you travel and you're aware there are people that are really suffer. And when you go to different parts of the world, you recognize what's really the essence of the things that we need to survive. And there was a man named Abraham Maslow who has been taught in every high school and college for the last multiple decades. And he has this hierarchy of needs. And it was in 1954. And he starts with the things that are building blocks. And his theory was this. You needed these physiological things. And there's a little picture of a guy eating food. And there's a bed for sleep, and then he adds uh, sexual activity in there. Then he goes to safety and then belonging, and he repeats that in, the, in that area. And then self-esteem. And if you get all your, you start feeling good about yourself, then you can really become something, and you're self-actualized. And it's that radical, hyper-individualized thing. And I, I can be all that I was meant to be. And it's an interesting thing. But what has happened because of this mindset is it's affected the thinking of Americans for decades in two particular ways. One is that when it comes to physical intimacy, we've had this mindset that says, it's a need. It's a need. Like, I have to have it to survive, like food or oxygen or Wi-Fi or coffee. You know, but we just go, oh, it's a, it's a must-have. Second thing that it's affected our thinking is this. Because of the first way that it's affected us, we think you can take that down, guys. It says, uh, 
we think this, what people do behind closed doors is none of my business. And let people express themselves, don't suppress them or judge them. And, and then what happens is we go through life and some of us come to a spot where we recognize our life is falling apart and we come to God and we hear about Jesus and we go, Jesus, my life's a wreck and I've kind of ruined it and I want to have some humility and I want you to lead my life and I'm going to follow you, Jesus. And God forgives us of our sin and God begins to do something in our life and we maybe start going to church, start reading the Bible, maybe we get baptized and as we start reading the Bible, the Bible talks to us about forgiveness and we're like, you know what? God forgave me, I need to start forgiving people. The Bible talks to me about anger, I need to start dealing with my anger. God, would you help me there? And then God starts talking to us about physical intimacy and if that's an area that we don't want to hear about, we're like, I'm going to go with Maslow on this and just like radical individualized, and I'm going to take the pieces I want of the Bible and not these pieces. Don't want to read the Bible anymore. And what happens is we form our own religion, and it's about back to us being in charge and radical, individualized, customized religion, not what God says. Now, can I just say God has an opinion about this? God has some thoughts. God is a good God when it comes to this area. God intends for human flourishing and for our well-being mentally. Like God wants to bless human beings. And so we have this. Now listen, as I talk about this today, if you're not a Christ follower, you're not a Christian, you're here today, I'm just really honored you just hang out with us. You're always welcome. You don't obviously have to do any of this. But what you have to decide if you're in this room and you're a Christ follower is you got to say, if Jesus says something about any part of my life, if he's my Lord, then I need to listen to what he says and change my life to line up with him, not make him change to line up with my life. And that's really where it comes down to it for all of us. Here's one of the clearest statements in the Bible about this topic, and I, we mentioned it last week, but I want to bring it up again. It's, it's this uh, Hebrews th chapter 13 that's placed in the Bible. We're going to put it on the screen for you. It reads this, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. And it's this idea that Christianity needs to have this viewpoint that marriage is honorable and anything that would destroy that, God's going to judge that. And Timothy Keller, great Christian author and pastor, he said it this way, the Bible teaches its members to conform their body into the shape of the gospel which is abstinence outside of marriage and it's fidelity within the marriage. And it's a great, great thing. And we don't even see that very often in, in our culture and sometimes even in our Christian churches. But I, I just want you to know my message is simple today. And it's one message. There's forgiveness of sins to anybody who repents. Come on, it's good news. Here's the thing that those two things that are mentioned in that scripture, immorality, that is defined as physical intimacy for any single non-married people. And adultery is defined as uh, physical intimacy with anyone other than who you are legally married to. And so that can look like a lot of different things. It could look like, uh, it could be like internet things that come in and tear, take our hearts away. It could look like an affair. It could look like anything. Those things God will judge those because those things hurt humanity. And so those two things are the things that are oftentimes things that we want just in our natural life. We go, but I want some of that. And it goes back to Maslow's view of, well, you need this and it's radical individualism. So however you need that is fine. But those two things fight against God's plan for human flourishing. I've seen like Instagram memes and stuff, and you have too, that say like, I want, want six-pack abs, but I also want tacos and cupcakes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's kind of like, like, like how we do our Christianity sometimes. Like, I want to follow Jesus, but I still kind of want some of this over here, you know. But let me just talk about the pain that some of the misuse of this has caused. Pornography has turned men into slaves and some women as well. And it's ruined many marriages, and it's taken a lot of creative people and numbed them into numbness where they can't function or create. Immorality has left people feeling shameful about their lives. It's left them feeling abandoned, hurt, compared with, and devalued. Adultery has broken up a lot of marriages, but it's damaged countless children that live through the aftermath of that. 
Not to mention the misery that happens when there is abuse in this area, violence and trafficking when this thing blows up and gets out of control. And so, the, you know, God's goodness in the, the boundaries on the river are not to impede or suppress us. It's to create a flow of the river and to create some life around that. But my message is really simple today. It's this. There's forgiveness of sins to everybody who repents. And I've had to do some repenting in this area of my life. I'm so thankful that God is a God of forgiveness. Man, I'm telling you here that there's no, that nobody gets a free pass in this room in the sense that it's probably 98% of the people in this room have had some kind of a sin. It might have been a thought. It might have been an actual action. But come on, we're all experienced some guilt in this room. And so, right, we're, I'm on good ground, right? A bunch of normal people in here. Yeah, awesome. It's good news because God cares about our lives. I want to give you six thoughts that I think are from the Lord. They're good thoughts. God gave them to me. I'm going to give them to you. And uh, I think they're good because I pray about this stuff. And I go, God, help me. So I'm going to give you six good thoughts. Are you ready? Number one, love and physical intimacy are not the same thing. You can go, you know, this is the lie that some people use, you know, if you love me (laughs) or that's how I show love. Yeah, but do you know you can show love without that? That's for real. You don't have to have physical intimacy to show someone you love them. It's true. There's not enough amens in the room, but I believe it. And I want to tell you a story about Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl, Frankl, say that a bunch of times, uh, wrote a book that I think is the second best book in the whole world. Y'all need to buy and put it next to your Bible. Bible number one, Viktor Frankl's, Frankl's book is called Man's Search for Meaning. And he survived the Holocaust And he found meaning in the suffering that he went through and all of that. It's a powerful, powerful book. And one of the things that happens as he's telling the story of him actually going through the concentration camp, he remembers his wife because he was separated from her when they put him on the train. And he he writes this. He says, my mind still clung to the image of my wife. A thought crossed my mind. I didn't know if she were still alive. I knew only one thing, which I have learned well by now, that love goes very far beyond the physical person of the beloved, it finds its deepest meaning in his spiritual being, his inner self, whether or not he or she is actually present, whether or not he or she is still alive at all, ceases somehow to be of importance. And what he was saying is his love carried him, even though he he didn't know even if she was alive, but that love that was on the inside carried him through. And I'm telling you that Uh, It's just true. You can express love without physical intimacy. Let's practice the amens. Come on, crowd. Ready? Amen. All right. Number two, great thought. Grace and forgiveness, those two concepts can get confused and abused. People don't understand what God's trying to say. And so those concepts of grace and forgiveness get confused. Let's start with with, uh, unpacking some of the confusion. We uh, learned in a staff training one time about this concept that they use in uh, corporate world trainings, and it's called the fundamental uh, attribution error. The fundamental attribution error kind of looks like this. I'll use my my buddy here. And it means like when when I look at his life and his mistakes, I judge him harsher than I judge my life and my mistakes. Let me break it down just a little bit farther. It looks like this. When he makes a mistake, I go, that's because his character, because he's just a bad person. But those same things when I do them, I go, oh, that was because of my circumstance. Character, my circumstance. Fundamental attribution error, where you start to judge other people harsher than you judge yourself, which nobody likes to really be real honest with themselves. All right? Let me just uh, take that thought and just take it one step further and go, there's a fundamental grace error that we make. All right? There's a fundamental grace error that can happen when we take uh, the, the concepts that are in the Bible. The error is in when somebody goes... Saturday night, I'm just going to, I'm going to sin. I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it because God will forgive me on Sunday. And I'll just ask for God's grace to cover it up. I heard God was forgiving, so I'm just, that's how I'm going to do it. You have made a fundamental grace error. You don't need grace for that. You need God's mercy for that. You need forgiveness. Mercy is when God says, you don't deserve it, but I'm going to forgive you anyway. And when you sinned, you don't need grace. You need his mercy to cleanse you. 
And you ought to get on your knees and you ought to not be so arrogant to think, oh, I'm just going to use God. No, God's granting you mercy where you didn't deserve it. And we ought to come to him, you know, humbly and say, God, I need your mercy. And then at that moment, once God gives his mercy to us, then he gives us grace. Grace is God's spirit and God, uh, grace is God's strength that comes into the life of a believer to help us to live now without sinning in the same way that we used to. That's what grace is. It's his power and his spirit. And so we need to not confuse or abuse those things. You can all practice your amen if you want to right now. Can I just say some other things? <laughs> so I'm going to. <laughs> Sometimes I've had people talk to me and they are, are a little bit arrogant about whatever's going on in their life. And they'll say, Pastor, you just need to accept me for who I am. This is who I am. And, you, and it's as if they're, what they're asking is they're saying, I want you to condone everything I do in my life and don't judge me, but just accept it. They want unconditional acceptance. But what God offers is not unconditional acceptance. What God offers is unconditional love and mercy to all who repent. He offers love to humanity, but he doesn't accept all my garbage. I don't want God to accept all my garbage. And when people are get so arrogant as to ask you, you just need to accept everything about me, then you need to tell them, you don't grant that to me, so I'm not granting that. You're not accepting my view. I'm not, and everything I believe in, how can you expect me to unconditionally accept everything about you? But I will give you my unconditional love because I've experienced that in Christ. I can give you that. It's an interesting thought. All right, number three. You guys with me so far? Yeah. Number three is this. Abstinence and celibacy are A-OK. -okay. Come on, somebody. This is free advertising. If you're single in this room, just put your hand up. Come on, I want to talk to my single people for a minute. Hello. All right, some of you are like, mm, it's complicated. All right. <laughs> Listen with Paul, one of the writers in the Bible. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, so I say to you who are not married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am. He actually puts singleness as this higher value. Like, this is actually the good life living up here in the single zone. All right? So that's his viewpoint. When you're single, you have an opportunity to deep dive your relationship with Jesus and you have an opportunity to serve in with the amount of time you have. Like it's a gift. And I wanted to say to you single people that I want you to see this with new eyes if this would help you today. I want to give you some power. And I want to say to the married folks, we're going to empower the single people in our church. And we're not going to be like always trying to hook them up all the time. Although Pastor Lisa has a gift. And if you need that, just put get on that prayer list. But we need to not be putting pressure on the single people as if they're not complete in who they are. They are 100 in God. They are actually everything that God made them to be. They're all right. And they can survive, and they're doing fine, and they're creative, and they're serving, and they've got an avenue to get to know Jesus better than some of the married people do because they can just deep dive into that. And, man, the Bible puts that at a high thing. You are complete, and I want you to know that God sees you complete as a single person. God wants to actually intervene in your life. God wants to show up in your prayer time in radical fashion. He wants to overwhelm you with his presence. The Bible says that God is a father to the fatherless and a husband to the widow. God is there with the single person. God walks with the single person. Single people, you are valued. You have gifts of God. You can preach, prophesy, build, serve coffee, teach at the school, serve at the hospital. You can do it all. Like there's a value on what you're doing. So God bless you and your singleness today. Number four. I told you it was some good thoughts. Number four. <laughs> that kind of hurt my neck. Uh, I'm so white. It's painful. All right. We tend to give ourselves a pass. We wonder, is there an exception for me? Like, like Pastor, that's all good for them. But, but you don't know what I've been through. <laughs> and we kind of give ourselves an exception. It's, it goes back to that fundamental attribution error. We go, that's good for them. But for me, uh, you don't know, you know, how lonely I was. It's why, you know, or you don't know what happened to me when I was young. Or I've had people say all these things to me. Or uh, you don't know that they weren't there for me, and that's why I needed to talk to somebody. Or I was made this way. Or, yeah, I did this, but at least I don't do this. And we start to 
not want to really look at. And we go, does God give me an excuse? Like, is there an exception, though, for me and for what I've been through? And when I've had people want to have honest conversations about a sexual addiction or a, an issue in their life that they're hitting a wall and a man will come to me and sit down across the table and we'll have an honest conversation, I, I start the conversation like this, and this is, I think, a good phrase, and it goes like this. All of us have to submit our sexuality to the lordship of Christ. So it's a level playing ground. Nobody gets to just do whatever they feel like. Nobody does. Like, we, we all need to go, no, Jesus is Lord of my life, my entire life, and I'm following him, so what he says I'm going to do. It's a simple message I have today, and I'm not wanting to create any guilt for anybody. As a pastor, I, I understand that uh, it's a sensitive topic, but I do have one really good message to tell you today. There's forgiveness of sins. To all who repent. If you can have some humility today, man, can I just tell you, God won't just forgive you. God will heal you. He'll take you back into the places where you were hurt as a person, begin to restore you. God is a rebuilder of the wall. He can begin to fix your relationships now. He can begin to make you look more like Christ. He can give you the courage to face the things you go, I could never face that back there. You can with Christ. He'll hold your hand. He'll carry you through. He'll bring wholeness to you. He can empower you in your situation where you're at right now. God is a good God. He doesn't stop at mercy. It's his beginning point. He gives forgiveness of sins to all who repent, but he gives grace. He gives his spirit. He puts the armor of God on you. He holds you up as his child. He begins to make you look like a princess and a prince in him. He begins to make your life whole again. God is so good. So my little small thought underneath that, number five, is that Maslow was wrong. Hello. <laughs> Mind blown. Turns out people can live without physical intimacy. What? Seriously, they can. And people are like, no, I can't. Yeah, you can. We actually, I'll compare it to this. My buddy um, Jeff Morgan works at the church, and he got on his home computer and, and put on our communication. To, uh, it's called Slack. And he said, hey, everybody, my phone went dead last night. It won't take a charge, so you can't text me. We get here this morning, I'm like, Jeff, that's the most awful thing ever. He goes, I know, I feel like I don't know what to do. Like, I don't have my phone. Can you imagine if you could, if, if just you lost your phone for the next three or four days? Some of you already, you're, 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 you're like, I'm texting my counselor right now. I'm having anxiety from you even mentioning that, Pastor. You're freaking out. But, like, Jeff is, is there, and he's like, I don't, know how I, I don't know how I live without my phone. And it's like, it's first world problems. We're selfish. We have everything we want. We're hyper-individually radical but the fact is you don't need that to survive <laughs> let me read the scripture to you in first corinthians and this is going to give some some of you need to hear this you just need to know some of you are like man i want to follow christ and this is a difficult area for me i get it that's great and i'm proud of you for being in church don't just stop and, and just go well i don't want to no let let jesus work in your life all the way through Here's what the Bible says. Paul's writing. He says, you say, and he's quoting idiot, uh, idiomatic phrases from the day, not idiots. He's quoting <laughs> idioms and ideas of the day. And he says, you might say, I am allowed to do anything. And he says, but not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. And then he quotes this common phrase of their day. You say, well, food was made for the stomach, and the stomach was made for food. He says this is true, uh, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power, just as he raised our Lord from the dead. What Paul's trying to do is say, it's not a spiritual religion. It's everything. It's what you do in your body and in your spirit. All of it combined. There's not two realms of your faith and your life. There's one realm. Everything, mind, soul, spirit, and body matters to God. He resurrected his own body. He's going to resurrect your body. What you do in your body is of concern to God. And then he ends with this. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? 
do you not or you do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price namely his son on the cross so you must honor God with your body come on that's truth that's going to set some people free to wrestle with that and go okay I see that and that matters point number six today our longing will only be fulfilled in God the longing in the human soul, it just isn't going to be fulfilled even in your marriage or in, like there's a longing that's deeper than that. There's a longing in the human soul that only God can fill. And I think he left that peace in humanity to drive us to go beyond what's in this world, what we see in relationships we have with people, to go beyond that and go, there's got to be more. And I, I'm trying to... To, I want to find some transcendence. I want to get above the plane of this world and any pain and pleasure that this world provides. I, there's got to be something above and beyond that. I'm telling you, you won't find it in another human being or multiple human beings or in images or dialogue. You will find that only in God, in his presence, in the creator who made you, who cares about your body, who cares about your mind and your spirit. He's the only one that can fulfill you in the deepest parts of who you are. Bruce Marshall is a Scottish author. In 1945, he wrote this. The young man who rings the bell at the brothel is unconsciously looking for God. And sometimes we turn to things we shouldn't turn to because it's all we know. I want to tell you there's something higher and better. God is deeper. He's the creator. Thomas Aquinas said this. He said, man cannot live without joy. That is why one deprived of true spiritual joys must spill over into carnal pleasures. I get it. If you, if you haven't experienced the presence of God and the joy that can be found there, then, then all you're left with is what you know. But I'm telling you, there's, a, there's a, a, something beyond happiness. There's a joy in the presence of Jesus. And this was echoed even earlier than that by Augustine, who said this, Thou hast formed us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. And he was a very immoral man. At one point in his writings, he said, God, make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> but he leaned into the grace of God, and he found pleasures of God were greater than the pleasures of this world. Perhaps what we need is more connection with Jesus in our life. Those are some of my six best thoughts, but there's a thought that trumps all those, and it's from the Bible. It's what Jesus said, and it's my simple message for you today. There's forgiveness of sins for all who repent. I just want to like yell out, all the all the oxen free. Everybody come running home. I was talking to my buddy on the phone this week, and he, he, we're talking about, he's a pastor, we're talking about messages we're working on, just sharing ideas and stuff, and he said, man, I heard something really cool about the word repent. He said, one of the best ideas of the word repent in the original language, it means to come home. I want to call some of you to come home today. Quit living in the pig pen of this world. Quit staying trapped in the shame. Quit trying to hide and act like nobody knows or can tell that you're not struggling with something. Like, just get honest and real. Get in a small group and get with your small group leader, young lady, and, and just say, I gotta, I need help. I, I'm looking for things, and they're not fulfilling me, and I want to be whole in Christ. And let somebody pray with you. Don't walk alone. Like, go up to the prayer at the uh, end of the service and go, would you pray with me? I, I need some help. Men, you need to not live in your isolated world and go, I'm going to tough this out. I'll take this message home and work on it tomorrow. Get on your knees before you leave church today and get honest with God. Go to the, sign up for the men's small group, and uh, the men's uh, retreat, and go and be around some men who found some victory in these difficult areas and go, I got to get some help. I'm telling you that God is still alive and he's not absent to the problems that we as humans face. He has power in his spirit for us in this area as well as every other area. Come on. He's a good God. 
Thank you so much for tuning in to New Venture Church online this week. We hope this message inspired you to live a vibrant faith in Jesus. We would love to hear what God is doing in your life. Send us your victory stories to amen at newventagechurch.com. If you love New Venture Church, subscribe and share this with a friend. You can also contribute to the mission of New Venture Church by clicking the giving link below. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you soon.